Let's get some more analysis and we can speak now to Madiha Afsal, who is uh, an author and a fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, here on France 24. Can I just start by asking you, what are your thoughts about how the whole voting process went in Pakistan today? Well, the day started off with telephone services being uh, cut off and internet uh, services being cut off. Uh, and that uh, is hugely important and a barrier to many voters who needed to find out where their polling stations were or which candidates were running from their party. Um, but people seem to still have turned out uh, to vote. Uh, and voting ended uh, at, at 5 p.m. Uh, results uh, are still not in, though now it is uh, past midnight uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, and there are concerns about what's taking uh, so long uh, for votes to come in. It seems, though, that uh, the early results that have come in um, are suggesting perhaps a, a surprise lead for uh, the underdog here, uh, the PTI-affiliated independents um, who were running all, all across the country. Yeah, because that would that would be one explanation for why we were expecting results, uh, you know, a uh, couple of hours ago, why we haven't had any official preliminary results. Uh, and that really puts the authorities there in, in, in a bit of a quandary, doesn't it? If the PTI does well and their main candidate is in prison, I mean, what, what, where, what do they do, supposing he's won? Right. Well, you know, he's actually not officially on the ballot uh, because Pakistan is a parliamentary system. Uh, what you will have is PTI forming government. And there are hurdles to that as well, because the party itself is not on the ballot. These are PTI backed or affiliated independents. Um, the Supreme Court made a decision which actually took away their party name and their party uh, symbol from the ballot. Um, so there will be hurdles to them forming government. But Imran Khan currently uh, is serving out multiple sentences in jail. There is a leader of the party that Khan himself has anointed in his place, um, uh, you know, who could, if, you know, the PTI affiliated independents do manage to pull off this surprise victory, the leader of the party presumably will be the prime minister, um, at least for uh, the time being. And then we'll have to wait to see what would happen with Khan's cases. Some people refer to Pakistan as being, and I quote here, a managed democracy. Um, with that in mind, uh, I mean, that, that obviously means that without the blessings of uh, uh, the generals in the military, you, you don't stand a chance as a, as a candidate in an election. Do you, do you think that's a fair assessment? You know, to date, uh, yes, Pakistan has been a democracy in the sense that people go to the polls, uh, there's, there's high turnout, uh, people... Pakistani citizens want a democracy, but the level, the, the playing field is always tilted in the favor of those who are in favor with the military and against those who are, uh, who have fallen out of favor with the military. So in the previous election, as an example, in 2018, Nawaz Sharif had fallen out of favor with the military. Imran Khan was in favor with the military. And, and we saw an election that was tilted in his favor, but um, we also saw a real vote for him and a real mandate for him. Um, fast forward this time around, it seemed that, um, you know, Nawaz Sharif, uh, who is now back in favor with the military, um, uh, you know, all the uh, scales were tipped in his favor. Um, but he has been out of the country for four years. Uh, uh, you know, uh, four years. He just returned uh, last October uh, in, in self-imposed exile in London. Uh, and many say that his party has fallen out of touch uh, with the country. And this new, youthful, uh, sort of middle-class demographic, and uh, it, it's important to note that 44% um, of the Pakistani electorate is under the age of 35, is very much with Imran Khan, that they uh, would sort of decide the result of this election had it been free and fair. Now, you know, we've seen a lot of pre-poll manipulation leading up to today, and uh, there are have been attempts um, you know, with shutting off cell phone services and internet services to, you know, um, uh, influence the vote today. So we'll see what, what what the results come out to be. But it it does seem that the mood of the country is not with uh, the the military's favored party or candidate.
Okay, and of course we're talking here about a, a, a huge country. I mean, we sometimes forget just how big Pakistan is, the world's fifth most populous nation, I think. Um, what implications does this election have for the region and for Pakistan's neighbours? Uh, I mean, are there any differences or notable differences between the different candidates in the running when it comes to foreign policy? You know, to date, um, uh, the foreign and security policy of Pakistan has really been run by its military, even when there are civilian governments. I would say that the differences tend to be marginal. Um, Nawaz Sharif uh, was uh, more pro uh, India, more pro-peace with India, but there are hurdles to that peace with India, um, uh, you know, uh, since the uh, August 2019 revocation of Kashmir's autonomy that, you know, whoever is the civilian prime minister is not going to be able to change. But he is generally more pro-India. I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, any prime minister is going to have a strong relationship with China because that is kind of the of the bedrock in some ways of Pakistan's um, foreign policy. But in terms of the relationship with the U.S., um, you know, uh, for Sharif, it would be based on economic and trade ties. Uh, with Khan, you know, uh, the relationship with the U.S. really saw a seesaw. Um, with uh, Trump, he had developed a good, uh, albeit transactional, relationship. With Biden, there was no relationship. So it would be interesting to see, um, you know, uh, what what comes of this election, because uh, with the relationship with the U.S., I would say that we will see probably uh, at least some marginal differences. They may not be huge. OK, and, and just lastly, I mean, with regards to the fate of Imran Khan, uh, do you think that once the dust has settled from the election, uh, I mean, would you see uh, a period of rehabilitation for him in, in, in public life and a, perhaps a release from prison, or, or do you think he's, his, his days in the public eye are, are, are well and truly over? Well, I think, you know, just uh, last week, uh, people were prepared to write off Imran Khan altogether. Uh, but uh, I think what uh, happens to him in the coming days, weeks, months, really does depend on uh, the results of the election today. And if PTI-affiliated independents do manage this surprise victory, despite all the odds and all the sort of the deck stacked against them, then I think we might end up seeing a rehabilitation of Imran Khan again against all the odds uh, and, you know, a period of his, the cases against him being taken away, the convictions against him being overturned. Because he is, but he does important. remain, doesn't he, incredibly popular with young people. I've spoken to young Pakistanis. They absolutely love Imran Khan. Right. And polls indicate uh, that uh, he is the most popular politician in the country. You know, if, if a presidential election, for instance, were to be held today and Imran Khan were on the ballot, one could say that he would win handily. Um, uh, but of course, you know, Pakistan is a parliamentary system, so that's uh, that's not the case. Um, indeed, he is, he is very popular. The issue is that he took on a zero-sum confrontation with Pakistan's military and it's, it's uh, the, the army chief. And that is why he is in the position he is in today, um, you know, in jail and sentenced uh, to many years in prison. Um, and that will be difficult to, to roll back because the mm. military, as you know, has been uh, the most powerful institution in Pakistan for all of its 70-some uh, years. OK, well, thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Madiha Afsal, uh, author and fellow in Foreign Policy Programme at the Brookings Institution, thank you very much indeed.